Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Oklahoma Insurance Department's Hoodwinked Fraud Series. Thank you for being here today. We are so glad that some of you guys took the time to join us. Um, I am Adrienne Selvage. I am part of the communications team at the Oklahoma Insurance Department, which we'll sometimes refer to as OIB. We are a state agency, so we do not sell insurance. Our job is to help the consumers if they have questions. If you have questions about your home, your auto, your health, um, you don't understand a claim denial, or you just don't understand your policy, you can always call us. We have a whole team that's here to help. Um, and then we also regulate the industry to make sure that the insurance companies um, are able to fulfill the promises they make whenever you get those policies. So that's a little bit of what we do. Wanted to tell you during this event, we're going to have some speakers and you'll be able to see and hear them, but we cannot see and hear you. So if you have any questions and we hope that you do, you can put them down in the chat box. It's going to be on my screen. It's on the bottom right hand side. There's a little box and I will say hello to everybody in a minute so you can see it. But if you have any questions, please type them there. And if you have a question for Ray or Michael, then we will get to those at the end. So um, let me introduce um, Ray Walker. Ray Walker is the director of the Medicare Assistance Program at the Oklahoma Insurance Department. He has more than 20 years experience working in and around the healthcare industry, primarily in insurance. Mr. Walker has had the privilege of speaking to people all over the state. He currently serves on the advisory committee to the state council on aging and recently completed his second term on the ship steering committee where he serves as vice chair of the ship steering committee as well as the leadership council for the MIPA grant program. All right, Ray, I'm kicking it over to you. All right, thanks Adrian. Good morning everybody. Uh, we're really grateful that you could come and join us today, and we think you're going to find this very, very interesting. Michael spoke for us last year, and I learned a great deal of information in terms of uh, what I can and can't do to help my loved ones. But before we get into her presentation, I wanted to remind everybody, we still have several more events coming up. Uh, the next one will be next Thursday, and we have Amy Knopziger from AARP, who's going to be joining us to talk about romance scams. So we hope you can join us for that one. The following week, Elaine Dodd, who's spoken for us before, will be joining us to talk about banking fraud. So again, get on our website at oid.ok.gov and take a look at those. And, and you can register for all of them or just the ones that you want to attend. We'd really like to have you join us for those events. Uh, regarding our program, the Medicare Assistance Program, I want to remind you that if you've got any loved ones, family members, uh, if you're a caregiver, whoever you might be, if you've got any questions or issues related to Medicare, don't hesitate to give us a call. Our phone number is 1-800-763-2828. Uh, we can talk to you about anything related to Medicare and, as well as Medicare fraud, which was kind of what started this Hoodwink series. Uh, we want to make sure that our seniors are well prepared. They're armed to protect themselves in the case somebody contacts them trying to get information that they shouldn't have. So let's go ahead and get into our presentation. I want to introduce Michael Fry. Uh, she is the uh, she leads the Fraud Prevention and Prosecution Division of the Oklahoma Attorney General's Office. This division is comprised of the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit and the Workers' Compensation Insurance Fraud Unit. Michael began her legal career in the Oklahoma County District Attorney's Office, where she prosecuted juvenile delinquents. She transitioned to the adult system where she prosecuted felonies, including general felonies, drug offenses, youthful offenders, gang related offenses, and capital murder. Michael joined the Attorney General's office as an advisor to the multi county grand jury in 2009. And in 2011, Ms. Fry was selected to lead the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. In 2019, Attorney General Mike Hunter created the Fraud Prevention and Prosecution Unit and added the Workers' Compensation and Insurance Fraud Unit to it. So, Michael, we are so glad you could join us today, and I am going to shut up and let you do your presentation. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I um, let me let me share my screen here just a little bit, and we'll get started. Um, as Ray said, I um, I'm a deputy attorney general for um, the Oklahoma Attorney General's Office. Um, your attorney general is Mike Hunter. 
Um, he was elected a couple of years ago. Um, I oversee the Medicaid fraud and the workers' compensation insurance fraud units. Primarily today, we're going to talk about what the Medicaid fraud control unit does. It is more um, situated for uh, you know investigation and prosecution of Medicaid fraud and elder abuse. And so, uh, what we do is Medicaid, not Medicare. Like Ray said, he does Medicare. We do Medicaid. Um, the unit was um, established in 1989. Uh, we prosecute not just Medicaid fraud. So we do investigation into abuse, neglect, exploitation, um, and the abuse can be sexual, verbal, physical abuse. Um, and our funding is 75% federal funding, so we get a grant. And the other 25% is, uh, is what we call uh, state share. And currently, um, the unit is funded by um, civil settlements, so um, those the, the defendants that commit Medicaid fraud, we get that money. And essentially what that means is the Medicaid fraud control unit does not cost the state any money. Um, it is, is self-funded for the most part. Um, we have jurisdiction in all 77 counties. Uh, we have offices in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. The Medicaid unit um, is investigates and prosecutes providers, so not recipients, um, generally not recipients. And um, for our abuse section, it is primarily caretakers. So um, the caretaker of an elderly or vulnerable adult in a board and care facility. Board and care facilities will we will. Uh, Define here in just a minute. We also can investigate abuse and neglect in a residential setting. Um, so if somebody's home, so you know your address. Um, if that abuse and neglect is a Medicaid recipient, if the victim is a Medicaid recipient, and it's in the um, in as as a provision of healthcare. So you might think of it as a. Um, you know, a, a personal care attendant or somebody like that is not only maybe they don't show up for work and um, the individual is um, left without medicine or food or, you know, so there's a, ne a neglect or abuse in that area. So we actually file the two, two claims. One is for the Medicaid fraud and the other is for the abuse or the neglect. Here's a definition of board and care facilities. It's two or more unrelated adults. Uh, in a residential setting where they receive a substantial part of their care is provided by a nurse or LPN. Um, and when we say substantial, what we mean is, um, is there somebody that provides their food, uh, their daily hygiene, uh, their medications, so they're not able to care for them themselves. And so in the past, that is traditionally been known as a nursing home, but in some cases, a, a, an assisted living facility might, might fall under those circumstances. A veteran center would fall under those circumstances. So um, it's not just uh, nursing homes. And we have a full staff. We have agents in both Oklahoma City and Tulsa. That, that's, that's their dedicated work. That's what they do all day, every day. Um, so they are what we would consider the state's expert on this type of, of uh, abuse or neglect. Um, so when we talk about abuse and neglect, who are we talking about? Um, we've got an elderly person in by statute is anyone who is over 62 or 62 or over. Um, I, there's probably many, many people out there that are 65 or 66 and really don't think that they're elderly and that's okay. Um, but by statute, they would fall under this and there's a special provision in law for that. Um, a vulnerable adult, here's the, here's the definition of a vulnerable adult who, you know, somebody that is physically or mentally disabled and they're substantially impaired in you know, those same things that I talked about for a, for a board and care, they're unable to protect themselves 
from abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And that's that's a key definition there because you can be self-sufficient um, in your activities of daily living. So you can cook your own food or you can uh, you can shower, you don't have a problem with that, but because of, of um, a mental or physical disability, um, you're not able to keep your neighbor from coming over and, and stealing your medicine out of your house or something like that. So that's a vulnerable adult. And throughout this presentation, what, what I want um, our folks to, to gather and understand is, is number one, here's the law. This is what the law says about uh, those folks that fall under, fall as victims under these provisions and what happens to those people that commit these crimes. What, what is the law? The other thing that ultimately we're going to get to later on is, you know, what can you do to help your family member? So is there some things that you can do to look out for your family member, either just day to day or on a legal basis? And so as we go through this, that's kind of where we're going to go with this presentation. So getting back to it, what is a caretaker? Um, it's basically anybody that takes on the responsibility of caring for another person, either through a family relationship, a contractual relationship, um, even if they've been appointed as a guardian um, or a limited guardianship or a conservator. Um, and that bottom one is, we'll get to that later, um, and that is some of the things that you can do to help your loved one. Um, let's so, so jumping into what is abuse and neglect? Here's the categories of elder abuse. So it's physical, sexual, mental, psychological neglect, uh, financial exploitation, or just uh, financial neglect. Um, and then there's drug diversion. And um, that last one, you, you may not, um, may be counterintuitive, but we'll get into that as well. Just so it's, you know, we're clear on what is the effect of elder abuse? Um, and it is, it is not just a physical or a, you know, like, uh, there's a broken bone. Of course, that's a medical situation, but just the psychological uh, impact on, um, uh, elders who have been abused, they are 300% more likely, uh, to, to have a death when those compared to those, to others that are not mistreated. There's also billions of dollars that are stolen or misappropriated from our elders on an annual basis. I believe these statistics were actually a couple of years old, so it could be even worse than what it is now. Um, so what is abuse? It's causing or permitting, um, and that permitting is important, um, the infliction of pain, um, injury, sexual abuse, um, it is also the deprivation of nutrition, clothing, shelter, um, those things which are important for activities of daily living. Um, and then it's also a willful infliction of an injury. These definitions are important because when we talk about neglect, um, abuse, the way that we see it in the unit, is, a, is, a, is an overt act. So it is a, a strike, um, it is, a, you know, somebody's pushed down, um, it is, it's an actual overt act. When we talk about neglect, the way that we look at it, is it's more likely to be a, um, a, a the absence or the omission of, a, of an important function that somebody's withheld. So somebody's withheld food or somebody's withheld medicine. Those things, that's how you can kind of distinguish what charge, if any, would be, uh, would be levied against a defendant. Um, here we are with, with the neglect. It's, um, it's a failure to protect. It's a, um, it's a you know, failure to get adequate shelter, clothing, food. Um, or it's a, it's an unreasonable risk of harm. So, um, let's talk about a, a bed sore. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our elders, they have thin, thinner skin and when they're laying in bed or sitting in a chair, 
um, mobility is an issue for them, then they can get what's called a pressure ulcer and, and you know, um, it's commonly called a bed sore. Um, if, if a person is in that situation and let's say they, they have some pressure sores and let's say the bedding has not been changed for a while. So there's a chance of, um, germs or diseases that could get into that sore or the sore is not cared for. Um, even though it, it may not have caused any, you know, the resident didn't actually go septic, but there was that risk because somebody didn't take care of that person. That's, that's a neglect. Um, caretaker financial exploitation. This is another one that um, is, I think, um, underreported or the individual, the, the loved one has actually passed before somebody realizes that there's an exploitation going on. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, kind of the signs that you can see on, on how to, how to um, see those red flags and perhaps act on them. But exploitation is the unjust or improper use of somebody else's resources or the elder's resources. Um, it, it's for a profit, a, a pecuniary gain, or um, just for somebody else's use without authorization. When you talk about a caretaker in a, a board and care facility, um, that's going to be on every occasion. A, a, a caretaker in a facility cannot take even $1 or more than $1 from an individual. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, let's talk real briefly about stimulus checks because that's in the news lately and, and has been for a year now. Um, we get a lot of calls on this. So um, those folks in a nursing home get their stimulus checks. If they're on Medicaid, they must, there's a, there's a limit on um, how much funds a Medicaid recipient can get or can keep in their, in their bank account. So stimulus checks will um, uh, are uh, deposited into those trust funds, but they are not used when uh, determining uh, Medicaid eligibility. They, um, if after a year those funds are not used, then yes, it can actually play into there. But for now, you know, when you first get it, um, your loved one is entitled to that money, and that's their money. They can spend it however they want. They can give it to whomever they want. It is their money and nursing homes or long-term care facilities cannot use that money to pay their, you know, to uh, pay the room and board fees unless it is authorized by the resident or their loved one. So um, we had several um, uh, complaints that the nursing home was keeping the money and wasn't giving it to the resident. There were a couple of times when we actually said, yeah, that's probably okay. And I'll give you an example. One of them was a gentleman that um, was mobile. He was able to leave the nursing home and come back. And he um, would go out and get um, bottles of alcohol. And the nursing home didn't want to give him $1,200 worth of money to come back in the nursing home with all of this liquor because it was a health or safety issue. And so in something like that, maybe it's okay. They were giving him the money, just not all at once. Um, so in other words, so the, the moral to this story is definitely um, the money belongs to the resident or the recipient of the money, but they need to spend it within a year if they're on Medicaid. Otherwise it will count against them in um, as far as receiving, continuing to receive Medicaid. Um, all right, let's talk about personal degradation. This came into effect November 1st of 2019, and I want to bring it to everybody's attention because um, in this day and age of social media, this particular uh, conduct has really become more egregious. And what that is, is a caretaker that does something to shame, degrade, humiliate, or otherwise harm the personal dignity of a, a vulnerable, a vulnerable adult. And really what we're talking about in some of the cases that we've seen 
is um, a, a caretaker and usually, and I hate to pick on young people, but usually it's the younger people that will take a video. One of the cases that we've had in the past is somebody will take a video of a um, partially clad or completely naked resident who is lying in bed and they've taken a video and they've sent it to their friends and say, this is what I have to put up with all day. Well, the individual in the in the video um, was not necessarily uh, co uh, cognizant of what was going on, but it doesn't matter. If that would embarrass you or I, then it's a crime. And the way that it's charged is abuse. So this is just a form of abuse. It does not, however, um, apply to folks that are caring for an individual. And if it's for medical uh, evaluation, if it's reporting abuse. So I'm going to take pictures of somebody's um, torso um, that has bruising that we think, you know, there's either a medical reason or there's a law enforcement reason. So it doesn't apply to them. And it doesn't apply to ongoing investigation. Otherwise, um, we don't take videos of our uh, adult residents and post them on Facebook or Twitter or some other uh, social platform. Now let's talk about drug diversion. So we, we talked about that earlier. Um, why is drug diversion an abuse? Because uh, right here, what it says is it's basically rerouting or using um, a, a legal drug for an illegal purpose. Um, the medications that are most commonly stolen are what we call PRN, and those are as needed. So PRN means as needed. And, the pri and primarily those drugs that are diverted, and it's probably no surprise to anybody, is this the hydrocodone, oxycodone, uh, the geragesic patches, which is fentanyl, and uh, morphine sulfate, that's a liquid. And um, those are the ones that are more, because those are the most addictive drugs that generally the most addictive drugs that are available in a nursing home or a, a boarding care facility. And one of the things that we, uh, that we talk about in, um, in drug diversion is, is, so as an example of something that is, um, that has happened in the past on drug diversion, um, you know, you get somebody that has a, a pill pack. It's a generally is 30 counts or 30 pills in this in the pill pack, and the whole pack will go missing. Or um, you know, some drugs, this is the worst for me, this is what's worse, is those pills will be popped out and then somebody will replace them with say aspirin or something that is not helpful for pain. And so the resident is is given that drug, um, you know, an aspirin, when in fact they need a high dose of oxycodone. So their pain, it does nothing for their pain. And, you know, we've heard over the years of, um, it didn't happen in Oklahoma, I think it was South Carolina, where there was a stage four cancer patient who um, her morphine was, uh, and her pills were being replaced by uh, saline and uh, the pills were being replaced by just aspirin. She was in excruciating pain because of the cancer and was not getting any relief. So that's why we say drug diversion, even though it is the, the legal term for it is larceny of a controlled dangerous substance, it can also be charged as abuse. Um, so let's go on to verbal abuse. Verbal abuse is language, gestures, actions, or behaviors that are caused uh, for shame or degradation. This is different than a, um, what we call the personal degradation. Mostly it is somebody is um, basically yelling at somebody, you know, a caretaker is yelling and saying, you're a horrible person and you're, you're worthless and I don't know why you're still here and, you know, awful things like that. And, um, and so that's what we call a verbal abuse. Um, so let's talk about the signs that you can attribute to those different acts. Um, we've got signs of abuse or neglect. Um, when your loved one has an outgoing, vibrant personality and all of a sudden they're withdrawn 
Um, they won't look you in the eye. Um, you know, there's uh, bruises, bumps, broken bones that are unexplained. And so let me let me talk a little bit about nursing home falls. I know that um, it seems um, it seems almost cruel, but nursing home residents are um, allowed to fall. That they because the alternative you get folks you know you, you, the nursing homes need to take care if they need a walker, they need a wheelchair, or they need help with mobilization to go to the bathroom, they have to help. But if you've got somebody that, you know, okay, I've put you to bed tonight and they continue to get up. So the resident continues to get up and they fall or they wanna get out of their wheelchair and fall. The alternative to those is a restraint and restraints of any kind, unless they are prescribed by a physician are illegal. So let me give you an example of a restraint. As a restraint could be a bed sheet tying you to a bed or a chair, your wheelchair. Um, it could be a chemical restraint, which is, of course, you know, a medication. I'm going to give you an extra dose of oxycontin uh, to make you go to sleep. Um, or oddly enough, a restraint could be bed rails. You know, if you're not able to get out of the bed, then that could be a restraint. So just because the moral to that story is just because someone has fallen or has a bruise doesn't mean that there's actually an abuse or neglect going on. It could very well be that the, the resident is just um, has fallen and the nursing home has done what they need to do to help keep them safe, you know, with the, the fall mats or, you know, you're a, you know, here's your call light, definitely call somebody. They just refuse to do it and they fall. Unfortunately, that's that's not the nursing home's fault. It's not to say there's nothing can be done, but we just want to make sure that um, these bruising is unexplained. Um, sometimes one of the, the smallest things that you may see of a resident is the change in their grooming. So, you know, there was somebody that was uh, very uh, well dressed or their hair was always combed and now it's not. Maybe that's the time to ask for a, ask a question. What's going on? Um, you know, can I comb your hair? And um, you know, are you okay? Ask those questions. But when you're looking, look at these signs. These are red flags. Signs of sexual abuse. Unfortunately, it happens. Um, so look for bruising in the inner thigh area, in the vaginal area, or or groin area. Um, if there is stained or bloody clothing, take a look at that. Now, keep in mind, um, a severe um, a urinary tract infection will sometimes cause bleeding. So, again, we're talking about, un, you know, unexplained. Um, and then sometimes our elders will report that, um, you know, there was somebody that came in the room. They don't know who it is, but somebody came in their room last night and touched them inappropriately. Um, there's uh, another, and it kind of goes back to the abuse and the neglect as well. When you, when your loved one um, is not looking at you like they used to, or um, they are, um, they won't, you know, a, a regular caregiver or a person that they normally visited with walks in the room and they immediately shut down. So, you know, the, the resident is visiting with you, someone walks in and it's a very, visible and uh, immediate reaction, then maybe that's the time to ask for a question. Now on here, it says victims of dementia will exhibit anxiety or excessive fear around the person that they think, that they believe um, may have abused or neglected them. Uh, they could also switch that and become very aggressive. Don't touch me, I don't, I don't you know, Things that didn't normally bother them now bother them. I want to stop here in just a minute and talk about dementia. Um, I will tell you, it's it's probably one of my pet peeves when I get a report from a nursing home where the administrator, or the RN says that person has dementia. So really, you know, you can't really talk to them. 
That's not necessarily true. Just because you have a diagnosis of dementia doesn't mean that your loved one is not able to communicate with you. As you see here, it could be signs that may not be able to talk to you. But remember, dementia has different stages. So, uh, you know, somebody that maybe doesn't remember birthdays well. Um, you know, they used to, but now they don't. Maybe that's a sign of dementia. That doesn't mean that we can't speak to them or you can't speak to them. So I would just say definitely um, don't rule out a possibility of speaking to a victim just because they have dementia. And um, that's what we, our agents do, and that's what we ask the police departments to do. Um, signs of verbal abuse. It's very much the same. It's belittling threats, verbalization of power and control. Um, when our vulnerable folks are in nursing homes, it is very easy for a caretaker to um, exhibit power and control. You do what I told you to do. Um, you don't you don't have your own voice. Um, sometimes that's because of verbal abuse, sometimes it's it's um, abuse or neglect. And sometimes it's just the person really shouldn't be in the job that they're in. They're just not a good communicator. But signs of it is excessive crying or emotional distress, aversion uh, to the suspect and uh, receipts from social events, which is the same signs as abuse and neglect. Let's talk about financial exploitation. One of the things that we always do in one of our investigations is we talk about um, how do we go about finding um, whether there's some exploitation. And, and many times it's in the documents, um, you know, bank records. You can't change, it doesn't matter who our suspect is. They can't go back and change a bank record. It is what it is. The things that we've seen are credit card purchases um, for, I'll tell you an example. We had a, a case where um, an individual was in a, in a, uh, in a nursing home um, for therapy and um, her caretaker said something about my daughter's pregnant. I don't have the money for a shower or something like that. And the, the resident was very kind. She had her credit card. She said, well, you know what? Just, just go get her, go get the party supplies. Well, this caretaker took the card and not only bought part party supplies, but they bought um, a, a crib and a car seat and some diapers. I mean, she just went whole hog on that credit card that you can't do that. And as I said earlier, if you're a caretaker or your caretaker is there, um, they cannot accept more than one dollar. So, it, you know, it doesn't matter how kind your loved one is and wants to do that, they can't take it. Some of the other things is, of course, missing personal belongings. A lot of that's jewelry, um, gifts to the caregiver. You know, I know you know your tires are low. Let me let me buy you some new tires. There's checks made out to cash and then ATM use. The other thing about ATM use is there's cameras there. So we've been able to go pull bank cameras and um, to see who is actually using those cards. Um, so things to look for. Um, we always follow the money. Um, there's a change to the victim's routine. So they didn't normally get out $500 at a shot, but this time they did. Um, banks, checks deposited into different bank accounts. Uh, the bank statements are never going, they're, they're not going to your, your loved one anymore. So, you know, you have mom at, at home and her, and her caregiver, her personal care attendant is um, watching out for her. And then the next thing you know, mom's bank statements aren't showing up. Um, there's no, like there's missing receipts. There's missing um, documents. Um, going back to the cash withdrawals. They normally get $500 out or not. Um, there's an increase in spending in food or clothing. Um, we've had some folks that, um, you know, uh, there's a comedian and he's called Kevin Hart and it, he's not old by any means, but this brings it to light that it really could be anybody. And what you watch for is 
um, Kevin Hart had a, a, a individual that would go buy his clothes for him. And uh, the individual while buying those clothes would buy lots of clothes for himself and was was stealing money. Well, the same can happen here. You know, you've got you, you know, you've got someone caring for your loved one and they'll go buy clothes. Well, the next thing you know, there's a five hundred dollar receipt for uh, J.C. Penney's and your mom only got a pair of shoes. Well, that doesn't make sense. And if there's evidence that a will or other uh, financial instruments been changed to somebody that is not would not be a normal recipient. So, um, you know, uh, if it's your mom it, it maybe you and your siblings uh, or your kids, if those things change, then there's there may be an issue. And, and again, we're going to talk about how to how to help with that in just a little bit. Um. And then going back to the victim didn't receive any benefit from spending the money. Um, so let's talk about just briefly the punishment for these types of offenses. Um, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, it is, it is upon conviction, could be in the penitentiary for up to 10 years, so zero to 10 years. Um, and it's up to two, that's for caretaker, and it's up to two years um for a non-caretaker so just anybody that um you know a family member or a neighbor even though they don't care for the loved one um if they're if they've abused a vulnerable adult it could be up to two years there's a fine and it could be prison or both the important thing about this is um it's an 85 percent crime and what that means is the individual must serve at least 85% of their term in the prison uh, prior to getting uh, being eligible for probation or for um, good time credit. Um, it is also, um, they also must serve, and that's a must, serve the first 30 days in county jail. Um, so even if they get probation, if they say, okay, you're going to get a deferred or, or a uh, suspended sentence, you still have to go to jail for 30 days. So that can be served on weekends rather than just a straight 30. So it's a pretty substantial penalty for this. The same thing goes for uh, sexual abuse, except the term is up to five, 15 years. Um, and they have to then register as a sex offender, which is even worse. Um, exploitation of the elderly, it depends on um, the amount of money stolen. So if we're talking about $100,000 or more, and in, in my term as the, as the director of the Medicaid fraud unit, we had somebody that transferred a house. They had somebody in the nursing home, and another individual, an outside individual, did some research, found out this person owned a home, owned this home, um, went to the nursing home and got the administrator to sign it over, sign over the deed. Um, and the nurse and the red, the, uh, administrator out of the goodness of his heart gave the resident $2,000, but the rest of the house was sold at a sheriff's auction and, and, uh, was then sold to another person. So, yes, more than a hundred thousand dollars can be stolen. Um, if it's and that term is up to 15 years, if it's less than 100,000, then it's uh, up to 10 years. A verbal abuse is a misdemeanor. So all, if all you're using is words, uh, then it is it's uh, can be charged as a misdemeanor and it's uh, up to one year in county jail or up to a thousand dollar fine or both. So here we are at the drug diversion. And I told you earlier that um, stealing someone's drug, the technical term is larceny of a controlled dangerous substance. The conviction is up to 10 years um, and uh, you're convicted of a felony. The other charge that could happen and has happened in a nursing home is obtaining controlled dangerous substance by fraud. Um, if you think about it outside of a nursing home, if you've got a doctor whose prescription pad was stolen, somebody fills it out and takes it to a pharmacy, that's obtained by fraud. In a nursing home, generally that's going to be somebody has called uh, the doctor and said, Mrs. Jones is out of her, uh, 
her as needed drugs, her morphine or her um, fentanyl patches, um, we need to order some more. And when they're ordered, they, ne they either never make it to the nursing home or they are, uh, you know, once they're put on the cart, they're stolen. And, and so um, it's the calling in of the prescription using a false name or using um, false information that's obtaining it by fraud. And that's a zero to 10 as well. For caretaker abuse, neglect, and exploitation, the victim cannot consent. Um, this is more prevalent in exploitation cases. So remember, I talked about the very kind lady who gave her credit card for the baby shower. Doesn't matter that she gave that card up. She cannot consent. And the reason for that, if you think about it, it goes back to that power and control because you've got somebody that is even in skilled nursing, uh, but more, mostly in a nursing home, you've got somebody that, um, depends on those caretakers to feed them or to you know help shower them it's a it's a dependency and if you've got somebody uh, that is coming in asking for this and they're and your your victim or your resident is um has some concerns about their own safety they're going to consent i mean they're going to give it to them just because they're afraid and so that is why a victim cannot consent and that's all that's something to keep in mind when you're checking on your loved one. So here we are at what you can do to prevent these things from happening. First thing is report it. Absolutely. If you believe that your loved one is suffering from abuse, neglect, exploitation, or, uh, you know, even personal degradation, Report it to these different organizations. So Adult Protective Services, that's in the Department of Human Services. Your local law enforcement. Um, I do, I also do a presentation to the um, Oklahoma City Police Academy and uh, their Recruit Academy. And so I um, am able to talk to these young police officers and say, take this seriously if you know if this were say a domestic violence situation you would go ask questions of the folks there do the same here um, definitely contact the medicaid fraud control unit at the end of this presentation we'll sh i'll give you i'll share some numbers that you can call you may see have seen in your doctor's office where there's a sign that says if you suspect medicaid fraud call this number well, that number is a direct line to one of my agents. He'll pick up the phone or if he's not available, he'll definitely call you back. But report it. Um, you can also report um, on the uh, Attorney General's website. There's a complaint form that you can fill out anonymously, um, but just make sure that you give us enough information to know where to go with our investigation, who to talk to. You can talk to the ombudsman. Now, the ombudsman are advocates for nursing home residents. That's their purpose. And so if your loved one, you or your loved one say, I want to report this, but I don't want you to tell anybody else, or I don't want you to tell law enforcement, the ombudsman cannot report it. That's, but they're there to help you get different services or to, to um, perhaps work through what, uh, what the issue is. And, and, you know, hopefully if it's, if it's a bad situation, and they will help you report it to law enforcement. Um, and then of course, there's the Department of Health. The Department of Health houses the um, Certified Nurse Aid Registry. So when, when there's bad conduct reported to them, they can revoke somebody's license. We also report to them as well once we get a conviction. Um, these are the folks that are required by law to report instances of elder abuse. It's going to be the people that you would, you're going to think are logically the people that have to report it. Um, Long-term care facility personnel are required by law to report incidents in their homes. Um, it's, it, what they, they call it mandatory reporting. They report it to Department of Health. I'm sorry, Department of Human Services. Um, and so, um, Department of Health will come out and oftentimes do surveys 
based on some of these reports. And the survey is basically an audit of care. So then another thing you can do is visit your loved ones. Uh, recognize the signs of abuse that we talked about. Um, and if they are in a nursing home, go to the facility at odd hours. You know, there's folks that um, they'll get up and they'll go have breakfast with their loved one every day. And, you know, that is, that's good. You should do that. But every once in a while, maybe you should stop in for supper or um, you come in at three o'clock in the afternoon, eight o'clock at night. Now, I know some of this has been um, minimized. The ability to do that has been minimized because of the COVID outbreak. Um, and so it's, it is important then to be able to FaceTime, to be able to uh, call the nursing home and just say, how's my loved one? Uh, if that person is not in a nursing home, but they live, um, they live at home, so go by often, go check on them, ask questions, but be respectful because remember, if they're living in their own home, basically by themselves or, you know, two spouses are living together, um, they believe that they're independent and they, and, and again, kind of like an uh, individual's you know, they have the right to fall. Um, loved ones have the right to give their money to whomever they want. It just can't be under undue influence. So um, those are things to ask. And trust me, you're going to get a lot farther if you are more respectful and not, you, why did you turn your money over to this dummy? Um, one of the other things to do, um, there is a consumer protection line in the Oklahoma Attorney General's office, they also have a complaint form online and they also have a number. And um, if you believe that um, somebody is taking advantage of your loved one, um, for example, a scammer, that's that's really the kind of their bailiwick. Um, but, you know, um, and I think uh, that we heard that um, there's gonna be a presentation on those romance frauds. Um, so, Definitely, there are resources out there um, to look after your loved one. One of the other things that you can do is create a guardianship. Now, a guardianship is a court appointed person, court appointed um, situation. It is, uh, there's, you have to, you have to apply to the court. You have to give notice to anybody that could object um, and throughout that process um, they will approve the actual guardian and they determine if you if you know your loved one even needs one um, they uh, they give the scope and the powers and um, that person once it's once the guardianship is established the the person that we're talking about is called a ward so it's a ward and a guardianship. Um, and then the guardianship must report annually to the court on how the funds were expended. Um, if it's if it is uh, part of their estate, how the money is expended or and if, if there's a guardianship over just the person, then um, we took we took my mom to the doctor on these days. If it's a guardianship just over the property, then this is how we spent the money. If it's over all of that, then it's all encompassing. Um, who may need a guardianship? Of course, you know, sometimes minors do for sure. An incapacitated or partially incapacitated person, um, the property located in the state for folks that don't live here. So that could be a guardianship over property. Your mom has moved off to your sister's house in uh, North Carolina, and but she still has property here. So you could be a guardianship. You could get a guardian over that. One of the things that I want I want to pause just for a minute and talk about when you when you want to get a guardian, um, and it kind of goes into the romance scams, but. You know, we see a lot where we've got an elderly person who lives in their own home and they get attached to a younger, um, starts out as a caregiver, but a younger person. And the next thing you know, they're married. 
And unfortunately in Oklahoma, um, there's not a lot we can do about that because once they become married, generally without a prenuptial agreement, it becomes community property. So when that happens, if you see your, your loved one growing attached to an individual that, you know, doesn't seem right, you know, that situation just seems weird. Not all situations are weird, but if this particular one does, then there's a, there's a, you can go get a guardianship. Um, the other thing you can do is go get a power of attorney. So when we get a guardianship, um, there's a general one, which you just have complete authority over the word, the property, the both. There's limited, we talked about that. It could be over the property, but there's a special one. And this is one that's effective for just 30 days, which may be what you need um, to sort out this romantic situation. Um, and it's it's mostly for emergencies. So um, could be for, for romance. It could also be um, they fell um, and they, there's no power of attorney. They fell and now they need somebody to make their, their medical decisions. So it could be something like that. And they're not, they're not able to uh, formulate a power of attorney. So there are different powers of attorney. There is uh, there's the durable, this is statutory. The statutory power of attorney is, is more used, used more for um, if you're gonna buy a car and say you and your spouse are gonna buy a car and um, they're not available. So they'll give you a statutory one for that one single purpose. I need you to sign, it's okay for you to sign on these papers to get this car. Power of attorney can be uh, conveyed at any time. It can be as expansive as you want. Uh, it can start at any time. So uh, my parents live at home. They're perfectly capable of taking care of their own uh, financial and healthcare needs, but I am their power of attorney right now. So is my sister. Um, so they don't have to be what we call incompetent. And uh, sometimes that term incompetence, it seems offensive, but what it basically means is they're just not able to take care of or make their own decisions. And um, again, like, like a, a guardianship, it, the power of attorney can be over whatever you want. The difference between those two is a power of attorney can be conveyed at any time. It can be with, withdrawn at any time. You can transfer it to anybody you want to transfer, but it must be done while you are competent or while your loved one is competent. So you've got somebody that seems to um, be forgetful more than they were, um, but they still remember that, you know, who the president is and what their birthday is and some other um, questions that, that are a good test for uh, competency. They can still do that. Maybe it's time to talk to them about a power of attorney. Um, my advice is if you have siblings or you, you know, you, you want to be able to visit with those, all of the family members and say, um, that, you know, we are, uh, we're, we're thinking about doing this. Are you okay? So those are just some, uh, for me, they're helpful hints or suggestions. Um, I think that we got some questions. Um, this is our contact information. We have, as I said, we have a Tulsa office, Oklahoma City office. So um, feel free to give us a call. All right, excellent, Michael. Thank you so much. That was, that was really good information. I learned a lot from that uh, that applies directly to some of my family members. We do have a few questions that I wanna to get to. We've only got about six minutes left, but somebody chatted in and it was actually one of the questions that I had written down. They asked, my family has suspected misconduct in the terms of theft at a nursing home, but is hesitant to report it for fear of retaliation toward our loved ones by the caregiver. What do you suggest in this type of a situation? So again, you can, um, you can certainly report it anonymously. I will tell you though, that if you suspect theft in a nursing home, 
the administrators and the, the executive caretakers are, are very cognizant of um, how damaged that is, and, and they will do an internal investigation. If it looks like something has happened, they will suspend that caretaker. That person won't be around anymore to, to take care of your loved one. They can move them to a different hall if you still have some concerns, but, but please do not hesitate to report it to the nursing home or to us, to the Medicaid Prep Unit. Okay, next question. You had mentioned early on about how the law is stated and it talks about the person that actually uh, commits the crime as well as someone who permits it to the crime to occur. So how does that apply? We've heard other speakers talk about how everyone in the state of Oklahoma is a mandatory reporter. Is that a situation where this applies? Is the fact that we are mandatory reporters, could someone, if they did suspect something, is there a liability issue there? Could be. So what, what that means is when, you, when we talk about permitting um, for us, let me give you an example. Um, we had a, an individual that it was in a, uh, it was in a, a mental, not a mental facility, but it, it disabled individuals. She was, you know, the individual was mad that this person wasn't, um, wasn't getting their sheets. So she takes out pepper spray and sprayed in, sprayed him in the face. So she's charged for actual abuse. There was another caretaker that stood by and watched it happen and didn't do anything about it. She was also charged. So that's why we're talking about permitting. Now, as to the question you asked, um, if somebody knows of an abusive individual working in a nursing home and they're required to report it and they do not, and then there is additional harm, then yeah, that could also be permitting. Wow, okay. Uh, next question, uh, how will we know if our family member is being financially exploited? And is there something we can do before uh, we suspect a problem? Absolutely. So if your loved one will allow it, and again, if they're living in their own home and they're competent, they can spend their money however they want. You may not agree with them, but they can spend their money however they want. But if you wanna take some safeguards, see if they'll let you be a signer on their account. And banks are really good. And I think um, when we, uh, Elaine Dodd will talk about it, but. From my experience, banks are really pretty good about um, if you tell them, this is my loved one, I think there may be a possibility of some exploitation. Would you call me if you see any large purchases? And they'll do it. Um, the other thing, too, is get that power of attorney um, and make sure that because you are going to look after, you're going to help your loved one look after their own resources. And you have a, a document that says you can. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much, Michael Fry, for joining us. I think Adrian's got something she needs to point out. I do have one more question. I know we're running out of time, but I did get a private question. Okay. And we've got an individual whose son and daughter-in-law have become a caregiver to a elderly um, relative that is um, declining in cognitive abilities. And they are concerned because they've kind of discovered a mess and the previous caretaker for this individual was a family member and they see debt commingled. So they feel like that previous caregiver has racked up some debt for a car, some credit cards. So what do you recommend they do in this situation? Well, so, um, Call local law enforcement, and I'm assuming this individual lives in their own home. So call local law enforcement, get the documentation now. So get a bank record, get those loan documents. Because remember, if you are a caretaker, you're a power of attorney, you're a guardian, you cannot misappropriate those funds for your own use. Doesn't matter if, if somebody says it's fine. You cannot do it. So definitely call local local law enforcement. And if, if you you know if you really fear that um, that that's a possibility, then go take their name off of the the vehicle. And you know if you've got a power of attorney for your loved one, and somebody's got a vehicle in their name, go take their name off of it. 
you still have to put them on the loan, but you can take their name off of the car. Okay, and they asked, and I'm sorry that I don't know what this is. They did also say, um, other than a referral referral to Lasso, is there anyone else we can talk to? Are you familiar with what that is? I am not. Is it is it spelled L A L A S O? I I don't know what that is. Okay. All right. That's all that I had over here, right? Okay, thanks. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us this week. Uh, hope you can be with us again next Thursday at 10 a.m. when Amy Knopfzegger is going to be talking about the romance scams that uh, Michael referred to, and then the week after that is Elaine Dodd. So please get on our website, oid.ok.gov. Take a look at those opportunities and join us if you can. So look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.